Welcome to the Block Fuel Podcast, where we sit down and speak with thought leaders in the ever-changing world of digital assets. So sit back and relax, because another episode of the Block Fuel Podcast begins now. Welcome back to the Block Fuel Podcast. Today, we are joined by Nabil Manji, the head of crypto and Web3 at WorldPay. Most people have heard of WorldPay, but for those who have not, can you give us a quick overview, just high level of the business? And now with the recent news of GTCR, how that may affect some of the future plans here for WorldPay? Well, first of all, Avi, thanks for having me on the podcast today. Super excited to be here. So as you mentioned, WorldPay is quite a large company, but a lot of people haven't heard of us. And the reason for that is we're really kind of a, a back-end payments infrastructure company. So we like to refer to ourselves as one of, if not the largest payment processors in the world or merchant acquirer, if you want to use industry lingo. What we actually do is we allow merchants, so retailers, online businesses, et cetera, to access consumer payments. So a lot of people don't realize this, but if you run a business like a retailer, whatever it might be, you actually, if you want to accept a Visa card or MasterCard or Apple Pay, Google Pay, et cetera, for most of those payment methods, you have to go through a payment processor like a WorldPay. And so we help clients large and small across all verticals across the world essentially accept and manage the consumer payments. We offer the core payment processing capability, but also fraud and risk management services, reporting and reconciliation services, chargeback and dispute management services. So really anything that touches that core consumer payment experience is our bread and butter. And we have our company that's been around for, depending on how you count it, a couple of decades. We've been built through acquisition over the years. Right now, as you mentioned in your intro, we are part of a company called FIS, but as you've seen in the news, and as you mentioned, we're going to be acquired by a private equity firm called GTCR. I'm super excited about it. I think GTCR has a great background in the payment space. They've got a great network and experience in operating companies like this. So I'm really excited to, you know, learn from their expertise, tap into their network and use that to drive growth for WorldPay as a company. Um, you know, the transaction hasn't happened yet. We expect it to close in the first quarter of next year. And so as we get closer to that time frame, I'm sure you'll see us talk more publicly about, you know, our strategy, how it might change, what that means, et cetera. But overall, I'm, I'm super excited about it. Yeah, this is super exciting, Nabil. And this is Jody here. Um, you know, I think as we've seen with a lot of, uh, you know, Web3 natives, early stage crypto companies, you know, there's a distrust of existing like Web2 companies and, and traditional finance businesses. Um, but I actually had a really interesting conversation with uh, early stage fintech in Hong Kong last week, and they were actually really had positive things to say about how WorldPay, you know, past five plus years has really committed to being a part of the crypto sector providing payment services to a lot of early stage crypto businesses, you know, we'd love to hear how, like, you know, you guys, you know, if you could give us maybe a quick background on when you guys got into the sector, started working with companies and how you've really built that trust, you know, over the past few years by like consistently not going back and forth, whether you want to support crypto, but, you know, providing great service and then, you know, building a name for yourselves. Sure. Yeah. So our, our journey in crypto actually goes back almost a decade probably way before most people even knew what crypto is. Um, so we started working in the space in 2015. We actually partnered with Coinbase, who I'm sure you guys know and a lot of your listeners will know, and enabled them to be one of, if not the first, you know, large crypto exchanges to accept Visa and MasterCard payments. That sounds pretty basic, but if you rewind the clock to 2015, it was extremely difficult, if not impossible, to find a way to use a debit card or credit card uh, to get into the crypto ecosystem. You know, if you were lucky enough to find an exchange or a broker that took fiat at all, it typically was a wire transfer. It might have a huge amount of FX fees, et cetera. Um, so that's where our journey started. And to be honest with you, we, we worked with Coinbase and it was a, a bit of a one-off. Uh, it wasn't a priority industry for us. We didn't have people that understood the space. We weren't really, you know, spending a lot of time and resource on it, but that all changed in 2017, 2018. Obviously, that's when crypto kind of became a, a word that a lot of people became feel familiar with as that first, you know, bull market or major bull market took place. And, you know, as a large payments company, as soon as something like that happens, we are closely paying attention. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro, we work with clients large and small across verticals and across the world. And so anytime you have a new technology coming about in the payment space, uh, we're paying a lot of attention. 
And what we decided in 2018, uh, 2019 timeframe is, hey, this is super interesting. This technology has a lot of potential use cases, particularly in the payments industry. Uh, we, we need to get a bit closer and invest a bit more in spending time with it. And so that's when we, we really started to, you know, hire people that understood the space, do some dedicated research and marketing and strat or strategic thinking around it. And so if you ask me, like, how long have we been focused in crypto? I would say about five years since that 2018 timeframe. And then fast forward to today, we've got a team of 30, 40 people, uh, many of whom are absolute, you know, crypto nutheads and love the space. Um, we work with 40 plus clients in the space around the world and have gotten really, really familiar, um, you know, with some of the opportunities and challenges in the space. Could you talk a little bit more specifically about the products you guys offer? Sure. Yeah. So specifically what we're doing is we're allowing exchanges, fiat on and off ramps, wallets, brokers, et cetera, to accept consumer payments. And what I mean by that is we basically enable them to uh, allow their consumers to buy crypto or their other products and services using a debit card, credit card, Apple Pay, Google Pay, local bank transfers or other local e-wallets or QR code based payments. Um, so it's really kind of opening the door for consumers to be able to transact with the crypto ecosystem. And other than that kind of core payment acceptance capabilities, we call it, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we provide fraud and risk management services, reporting and reconciliation services, chargeback and dispute management services, and also some, you know, off ramp and disbursement capabilities as well. Yeah. And I think that like, you know, there's a, there's a cool narrative going around of like, you could be super hardcore native into crypto and, you know, maybe you love a lot of these like new crypto focused apps and don't love the big, you know, centralized exchanges, but people really have to take their hats off and say like, Hey, Coinbase on like onboarded, you know, a massive amount of people into crypto. So you really have to, you know, show them respect of being OGs in the space. And I think for you guys, that's a, it's a really cool story that you have where you can be like, well, a lot of those crypto purchases in the 2017 bull run, you know, were facilitated on Coinbase with WorldPay. So, yeah, I loved it. Like, you know, yeah, near in the space. I'm obviously biased, but I like to think that's at least one of the reasons why Coinbase was so successful in that 2017, <laughs> 2018 bull run is, you know, as I mentioned, they were one of, if not the only major exchange to be able to accept card payments, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you're in the US or Canada or Europe, cards are still a very, very prevalent payment method. Yeah. I guess on the uh, the card side, um, you know, would love to hear more about, you know, we, Avi and I were looking at the um, the partnership with Visa on how Visa is piloting a new like UFCC settlement, you know, love to hear, especially like what you see is, you know, for new users not involved in the payment space, what you see is really the value there, you know, is it, is it speed? Is it flexibility? You know, what are, what are some of the reasons that you would dive in and invest, you know, in that pilot? It's everything. Um, so I actually gave a talk on this at Token 2049 in Singapore a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it's near and dear to my heart. But for those that aren't familiar with the payments industry and how money moves, um, there's this, there's this model called the four party model, which has been kind of the cornerstone of the payments industry for 50 ish plus years. Basically, since card payments have existed, uh, they have operated using this four party model. And what the four party model uh, includes is, uh, the first party is what we call the issuing bank. So this is the bank if you're a consumer that gave you your debit or credit card. So for example, in the US, I think Chase is the largest card issuer. Uh, so Chase would be uh, one corner of the, the four party model. The, the second participant would be a card network. It's like a Visa MasterCard, for example. And then the third participant would be us, the payment processor, a merchant acquirer. And then the final participant, the fourth party is the merchant the retailer that you're actually spending money at. And so the way that money has moved in the consumer payment space for the last 50 years and continues to move today is really in a straight line um, from that first party to that fourth party. So the money goes from the consumer's bank that gave them the card to Visa or MasterCard, depending on which card brand that card is, and then to the payment processor and then to the merchant. So it literally goes from one party to the second party, to the third party, to the fourth party. And that's how it works. And that's fine. Um, you know, that, that model has allowed Visa and MasterCard to have a combined market capitalization of almost a trillion dollars. It's allowed other massive card companies like American Express, Discover, JCB, China Union Pay, et cetera, to, you know, evolve and flourish. 
it's allowed consumers to make seamless payments, you know, in the, two, in the order of magnitude of like 25, 30 trillion dollars a year across these card networks. Uh, they're incredibly reliable and robust. I think the last time Visa's network had a settlement issue was in 2017. So if you think about moving, you know, tens of trillions of dollars a year and not having a single issue in five years, that's, that's pretty incredible, right? In terms of upstream. So it's a really, it's a really great model. It's a really great system, but that doesn't mean it can't be improved. And so as we look at it, as Visa looks at it, we are really excited about the opportunity for stable coins to make improvements, not to disrupt, but to enhance. And um, so if you think about that four party model, as we all know, when you move fiat, it's not always quick. It's not always cheap. It's not always available on the weekends or on public holidays. And so that four party model has a lot of, you know, inherent limitations in terms of speed and cost. And what stable coins can do is they can help address that. So imagine if we could have the four parties in that model using stable coin as their medium of transaction. Well, now you've made it available 24 seven, 365 instead of Monday through Friday, excluding public holidays. That's a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. And what if you could make it so that you could do kind of real time or multiple time a day settlement without incurring massive amounts of per transaction fees? Well, stable coins on the right layer one can do that. And in today's market where interest rates are at a multi-decade high, getting your money faster is a big value driver when it comes to working capital or the ability to earn yield on deposits for our merchants, et cetera. So we're just at the kind of precipice of this. Um, you know, Visa in their announcement, you know, talked about really us and one other player that have worked in this pilot. If you look around the world, there's hundreds, if not thousands of payment processors. So the, the penetration is extremely low right now, but you know, the, the promise and the value proposition is there. And so we're continuing to invest in innovating with Visa, with MasterCard as well. And we're excited about what that means for enhancing the, the four party model in the future. Yeah, I think it, it's, uh. Super excited to see a name like Visa, right? Get into the space and, and seeing obviously WorldPay, FIS, and um, we just spoke with Broadridge, you know, uh, and, and so we're seeing this transition, right? Of, of a lot of institutions, we were just at permissionless. There's a lot more institutional uh, brands that are coming yeah. in and you're starting to see the dust settle on some of these pump and dump, you know, NFT projects and things yeah. like that. You mentioned you were just at Korea Blockchain um, and, and you're going to Hong Kong for an event. Um, as you've seen some of these more institutional players kind of come into the space, I'd love to hear about, like any learnings that you took from other companies, maybe at Korea Blockchain that you'll take back or, or just think we're interested in. And then I'd like to throw a fun question in there too. Something non-crypto related that you met someone that was really interesting in the space too over at Korea Blockchain. Yeah. So lots to unpack there. I would say it, for me, it's less about specific learnings or takeaways and it's more observing how different countries and different regions are thinking about things like regulatory framework or how different sectors of their economy are investing in or looking at the space. So for example, in Singapore, they're being quite um, progressive when it comes to stablecoin regulations, example. Mm -hmm. So when I was there a few weeks ago, there was a lot of talk about that. Um, and you go to Korea and it's, it's different, right? There's not that many people talking about stablecoins there. So for me, what's been interesting is just observing those regional differences and what that means in terms of, again, what sort of enterprises and institutions are investing, what sort of capital and talent those markets are attracting in the crypto space, et cetera. Uh, and then my favorite takeaway from Korea Blockchain League is actually not a person I met, uh, I, or a person I met, but a, a food I was introduced to. So I'm, I'm quite an adventurous eater. Uh, I will eat almost anything. Uh, and one of my friends took me to a seafood market where it's, it's super cool. You, it's like, a, it's like a two level warehouse and there's a giant seafood market on the bottom floor with a lot of different vendors. And you go down there, you just kind of point at what you want. So we pointed at some crab and some fish and octopus and squid or whatever. And then you tell them what restaurant you're going to upstairs, which is in the second level is all restaurants. That's and then they just send it right up there and then it gets prepared for you. So it's kind of cool. You like, you know, you see your food and then five minutes later it's on your plate. Um, but they were like, Nabil, you got to try live octopus. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't know how I feel about that. But um, they convinced me and it was absolutely delicious. So now every time I talk to somebody about my trip in Korea, I always talk about how live octopus is now like a top five favorite food of mine because it is absolutely amazing. 
So is it moving on your on your plate then? It's, it's like, moving. It's really cool. Wow. Uh, some people might find that really weird. I think octopus are all obviously super cool and super intelligent. But yeah. one thing that's very interesting about octopus I didn't know up until this day is that their entire body is their nervous system. Yeah. So, um, like just to be like a little bit grotesque, you know, if you cut off a human's arm, it's not going to keep moving, right? It's not connected to the nervous system anymore. It's just going to like go limp. What they do when they serve you this octopus is they take an octopus and they cut it up into little tiny pieces, but all those little tiny pieces are still moving because they're like an autonomous nervous system. It's kind of interesting. It's like in the bowl and you eat some and then, you know, it's like an appetizer. So you have a little bit, there's a little bit still sitting there and then the bowl stops moving. But then as soon as you like put your chopsticks in there, it all just starts moving again. Even if it's been like an hour. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that's the content you get on block feel that you won't get on other podcasts, <laughs> by the way. That, that's yeah, awesome. it's a little bit grotesque. I don't know. It was a bit weird. I, I was a bit uh, trepidatious when I was asked to try it, but it was it was phenomenal. So Yeah, I'm going to say I was in uh, wow. Vietnam a few years back and, and uh, we ate some like quail eggs, but they had like snakes. Snakes are really big actually in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, cool. I never tried it, but I that is something that I, I would like and I'm an adventurous eater as well. Yeah, yeah, I haven't tried snakes, so I'll have to add that to the list. I yeah. did a lot of friend, I guess, last time I was in Tokyo, but now, okay. I mean, yeah, they're, not, they're not decentralized food, like, you're, like the octopus, so. <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go. One thing that we've kind of seen a lot recently in the news is really around, like, real world, like, tokenizing real world assets. Um, you know, so from you guys from the acquiring side, um, are you seeing a lot of startups or institutions or anyone that's looking to, like, accept payments for, you know, buying certain assets that are say you know traditional like securities whether it's or real estate or art or you know anything that you would consider like a real world asset or do you think this is just something that people are like looking to grasp on to the next narrative that could cause a bull run probably a little bit of both uh as is the case with most things in you know many evolving or innovating industries uh so are we seeing companies you know either invest more in the space or start to pop up uh, with this is like their use case or what they want to build and come to us for services. Absolutely. Uh, have we decided to work with many of them? Not many, if I'm being honest. And part of that's just because many of them are a bit small and our, our crypto business is very enterprise focused. So, um, you know, for, for a client, it may not make sense to work with us just from an administrative perspective until they reach a certain size. And a lot of these players in the tokenization state space are startups, right? They're just not kind of ready to deal with us. Um, the second is, is one of the challenges, but also opportunities of tokenization is how do you think about not only the technology side, which I think a lot of people are working on, but the regulatory compliance and security side. So you talked about tokenizing something like real estate or security. Well, that's great. The technology to do that exists and is relatively straightforward. And there's a lot of people doing it. But how you represent some of the compliance related aspects of those assets uh, and embed that in the code and then get people to buy into that, that's a much more complex question that has not been solved in most places. And the the reason that's very relevant for us is, of course, as a big payments company, we are regulated in every jurisdiction that we do business in. And part of our regulatory responsibility is to make sure that the clients we're providing services to uh, have the appropriate controls and policies and procedures and where necessary, the right licenses and registrations to offer the products and services that they are. And so this is an area where I think from a tech perspective and investment perspective, it's super exciting. There's a lot of money going to the space. There's actually a lot of institutional players that are investigating and investing in the space, but it's a space that we are being, I would say, quite thoughtful and deliberate about in terms of who we want to work with because of some of that ambiguity around the non-technical side of the equation. Mm-hmm. I think that's interesting. Well, you got to kind of factor in regulation, risk appetite, and things of that nature. So you guys have been in the space for quite some time. Mm-hmm. You know, you've been at the company for a, a little bit as well. Since you've joined, have you seen the risk appetite a bit, I guess, with regulation kind of still in this state of flux? Have you seen kind of a wait and see approach or from an institutional side? Are you guys, how do you push internally? Because there's probably a lot of uh, other generational folks in, in the traditional finance space. Your job's probably a little difficult trying to convince people internally to keep pushing the, the, the throttle there. Have you seen the risk appetite change? And what are some of the challenges working at 
you know, a big institution like FIS, where a startup can make a decision very quickly and then they may get in trouble. Like, obviously, you guys have to take a more cautious and, and uh, structured approach, I'd imagine. Yeah. So lots there. So I'll say a couple of things. I spent a lot of my time thinking about our risk appetite, working with our you know partners in legal and compliance and other areas um, to make sure that we are making you know informed, educated, thoughtful decisions as it relates to the the topic of risk more broadly. Um, I would say there's a lot of benefits to working at a company like FIS and what that means in terms of risk appetite. So one is the amount of subject matter expertise we have across the financial services landscape is absolutely tremendous. And because we're such a, a global company, we've got, you know, expertise and perspectives in all the local markets where regulation is evolving as it relates to crypto. Um, so we've got a great team, not only of what I would call crypto regulatory and compliance experts, but also just general local, you know, compliance experts. And of course, we work with, you know, external vendors and in, in markets as well. And so I think because of our breadth and depth of expertise, we actually do have a really good read on how the regulatory environment for crypto is evolving. And we regularly update our, you know, risk appetite for a certain market based on how, you know, the regulatory environment is evolving. We stay quite on top of it, I think is, the, is, is point number one. Second is, I think what's allowed us in part to be successful in navigating this particular topic is we've had a lot of great top down support from the executive team and saying, Hey, you know, we want to focus on this area. We want to continue to grow. Um, we understand some of the challenges, et cetera. And so I think it's really important, you know, for any large company, if they want to invest in a new vertical or a new technology, you really need that top down support to get the organization behind it. And we've been really lucky at World Pay and FIS more broadly to have that top down support. Um, does that mean I always agree with everything you know, our legal and compliance teams are saying? Of course not, right? There's there's that healthy tension, but I think by and large, we're making really, really educated decisions. And I think you've seen the kind of result of that play out in the fact that we have been in the space for almost longer than any other, any other payments company. We do have really what I would call the blue chip clients. We are you know, working with business models that we have a, a high degree of comfort in terms of uh, the way they operate, a good understanding of the way they operate, and what the regulatory requirements are, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think alongside that, like, it, it's good to hear, like, you know, having, you know, smart leaders, you know, within in the organization that are making good decisions, thoughtful decisions, listening to, like, people on the ground like yourself that, like, go into these events. Mm -hmm. I guess when you have, when you're speaking with leaders, you know, internally and they're seeing the news on, you know, different countries are rolling out like CBDCs and, you know, central yep. bank digital currencies. Um, how have you had, if you could share, like uh, conversations with them around, you're probably speaking with more of the crypto native side, and then they might see potential opportunities working with, say, larger sovereign governments that are looking yeah. at programs. And, you know, how have some of those conversations gone? Yeah, so a couple of different thoughts there. So yes, I interact with a lot of crypto natives, um, but also there are a lot of crypto companies that you would call crypto natives, but have kind of evolved into, I hate to use the word corporates or like classic institutions, but let's just say they've grown up or they've matured. So think about like a Coinbase or a Kraken or a crypto.com, you know, these are big companies. These are multi thousand employee, you know, multi hundred million dollar revenue, if not billion dollar plus revenue companies that are operating in many different jurisdictions with a regulated business model. Like these are complex, sophisticated organizations. So yes, they're crypto natives, but I think when I hear the word crypto natives, I think of a startup, right? Um, so we, we kind of see both. We see the earlier side of crypto, but we also see the more mature, sophisticated side of crypto. So we're able to understand that perspective. And then of course, you know, we do work with a number of governments around the world. Uh, on a variety of topics, whether it's payments or, you know, broader fintech or banking infrastructure, especially with our parent company, FIS. And what I would say is we keep a very close pulse on how CBDCs are developing around the world. We've got a couple of folks uh, at FIS and WorldPay that are experts in the space. Um, we're involved in a couple of consultation and pilot programs with various banks. So it's definitely an area that we're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, I think from the WorldPay perspective, you know, we're we, we like to stay payment method agnostic. So, you know, we offer cards, we offer e-wallets, we offer local bank transfers, uh, QR code based payments, whatever it might be. So 
really, we just want to enable our clients to get paid in the way that their consumers want to pay them. And so if and when CBDCs come out in the markets in which we operate, and to the extent they become, you know, legal mandatory tender and or a preferred method of payment from consumers in those countries, we will absolutely look to be able to support that. So definitely a space that I personally am excited about in terms of the amount of investment going on there. I think it's not a coincidence that almost every developed uh, economy central bank is looking at CBDCs. Uh, I think if you read between the tea leaves about what some of these countries are saying, CBDCs are probably a, a when and not an if. But I think what's a bit ambiguous now is what's the technology stack going to look like? Are there going to be limits? Is it going to be different for wholesale versus retail? What are the privacy implications? But I think a lot of governments have like, you know, decided they want to do it, but now they're working through those nitty gritty implementation questions, which are going to take years. But obviously, when you roll out a new form of legal tender, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. I think one of the more interesting, I guess, negative feedback, you know, not against a world payer FIS, but industry as a whole, right, is the kind of the thoughts around environmental sustainability. Obviously, that's a hot button topic. I'm um, curious to see if like world pays do anything to address some of those concerns, you know, with the mining transactions and better understanding of like, I guess, the role that payments industry in general could help promote any eco-friendly practices. That's a good question. So to be clear, you know, we, do, we don't do any mining ourselves. Um, so we're not like generating crypto or anything like that. I, I think we've taken a really hard look at ESG, particularly over the past couple of years, and have started to publish our own annual ESG report. So we're taking quite a bit of action as a company, which I'm really excited about. I think obviously those who work with us, you know, they know our perspective on these things because we talk about it quite publicly. And of course, we, we would hope they share those values. But at the end of the day, each company needs to kind of make a decision for itself, you know, based on the industry they operate in, their business model, how energy intensive that is, you know, the country they operate in, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's something that, you know, is, is near and dear to our heart, but it's also an area where I think there's a lot of kind of, you know, company sovereignty, so to speak, over how they, they deal with those issues. I think we're like, we're hitting on a few topics that are pretty recurring throughout like a lot of our conversations, but you know, what would you say Nabil gets excited about? Like, what are the things that you could share with us that like you jump out of bed or you crawl out of bed and you're like, Hey, I'm excited to like uh -huh. this conversation this morning, because this is a cool project that not a lot of people know about. Uh, pretty nerdy, boring stuff, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> how do I explain this? <laughs> Payments is like extremely complex, but that's also what makes it extremely interesting. But if I went and told somebody, hey, I'm really excited to go talk to this company about how they're going to be able to settle me twice a day instead of once a day, people will be like, that's the most boring thing I've ever heard. But to me, I'm like, wow, that's 100% improvement, right? So for me, a lot of the innovation that's actually interesting is, is on that backend infrastructure, you know, kind of foundational building block side. So I get really excited when I meet companies that are thinking about backend payments infrastructure from a whole new way. That's what excites me. I think a lot of companies and a lot of fintechs in the past decade have done a lot to make the front end of fintech and financial services a lot better. So if you think about like just even the consumer experience of a mobile banking app today versus 10 years ago, oh my gosh, night and day, right? Okay. Like they're just so much better. The amount of stuff you can do in your banking app or lending app or, you know, the fact that you can track your entire financial asset portfolio in a single, you know, graphical user interface, like. That's stuff nobody would have imagined 10 years ago. And there's been a lot of innovation and a lot of consumer benefit on the front end. I think on the back end, it's been a lot slower. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Um, back end is typically the stuff that's regulating. Back end is the stuff where you can't have a single point of failure, where you need to have 100% uptime, not 99.999%, right? So there's a lot of reasons that back end moves a lot slower in terms of iterating on the technology or delivering step changes uh, in terms of increasing value. But that's the stuff, at least that interests me and where I think the, the bigger opportunity is from the addressable market perspective. So you kind of touched on this a little bit, but looking five years, 10 years down the road, the, the name change kind of from crypto, which had a negative connotation, people are starting to call it digital assets, right? So how do you see kind of just the overall feeling towards the industry changing, I guess, as more institutions start to come into play? Well, I hope it's on that kind of positive trend and continues that momentum. What I would say is interesting is 
you know, in traditional finance and, you know, the people I talk to, pretty much everybody knows about crypto. I think five years ago, that wasn't the case. But today, I think if you walk up to someone that works in a bank or works in a fintech or like a, a adjacent service provider or something like that, they, they probably know what Bitcoin is. They probably understand, at least at a high level, what distributed ledger technology is, et cetera. I think what I hope five years from now is a, yes, the reputational challenges of the past years are behind us. There'll be closure on certain things like the FTX lawsuit that's just started with SBF, et cetera. And I think by that point of time, you will have things like CBDCs in circulation. You may have large banks and enterprises dealing in tokenized assets, et cetera. So I, I hope the conversation is less about, you know, is it legitimate? Is it good? More towards like, how can it help my business? How can I leverage it, et cetera? No, this is fascinating. It's always interesting to, to speak with some of the large institutions that are in the space. I think one thing I, I mentioned when I was speaking with Carol House is I think the, there just needs to be more conversation, right? And, and being, uh, I guess, transparent with folks that are more Web2 native who may have lost a lot of money in the first market and they joined during the downturn. I think it's really important to kind of hear from some of the thought leaders in the space. And so really appreciate you coming on here today to the Block Fuel podcast and definitely hope to see you around at some of the conferences. Yeah, definitely. And again, thanks for having me. Hopefully we can meet in person soon.